Okay, so uh, what did we see last class? We looked at uh, pi matches and t matches, right? So what you saw in pi matches is the intermediate impedance is in between the input and output impedances, and in t matches it's much higher. Okay, so the one thing to remember. Thanks for Val, uh, thanks to Vallabh for uh, reminding. Um, I forgot to mention this. Since your R i is lower than R n and R naught, I mean uh, R n and R l, what can happen is, uh, depending on your Q's, you could have your uh, intermediate impedance to come out to be very small, right? A few ohms, couple of ohms, or something like that. And um, what you will see is, we'll today we'll cover inductors in class. You'll find that the series resistance of these inductors can be as high as a few ohms, right? So what that means is, the match is going to be very sensitive to your uh, inductor uh, res resistive parasitics of your inductor. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful. So you may prefer to do uh, T matches in many cases. Okay, so that's a point. Come on. Okay, so what we'll do in today's class is we'll continue with matching. Um, I wanted to complete this by last class because I don't want to cover um, more than a couple of classes on matching. But we'll quickly look maybe for uh, five minutes till 11:10, right? We'll look at two other kinds of matches. What I'll do is I'll just give you the uh, what kind of matches they are. I'll give you the final result. The complete notes are actually already up on the website. Okay, so you can take a look at it for the derivation. If you have any questions, just uh, set up an appointment with me and come and meet me to ask me questions about it. Okay, so what are the other kinds of matches? Tab capacitor matches. Okay. So that looks like this. So this is your tapped capacitor match. Okay. You have L C1, C2, you have R in, and you have let's say R P, right? Or you can call it R out. Okay. So what this, what do you notice? First thing you notice is you have three degrees of freedom, right? L C1 and C2. That's what you want from. You want at least three degrees of freedom from any match. If you want to set your R out over R n, your Q and your frequency of match. Okay. So you notice you automatically have these three degrees of freedom. Okay. So how do you do this? So what you can do is, let's say you want to match uh, to a certain in, uh, impedance at the input. And you have a certain load resistance at RP, right? The way you know is, um, actually, instead of calling this RP, let me call this R2 because uh, maybe R out. Okay. So what you'll see is when you analyze this network, you'll find that your R in, in this case, is greater than R out. So this is an upwards transformation. Okay, so if if you are looking at it the other way, if you are trying to match it this way, so sorry. So if you are trying to um, just recording, okay, let's make sure. Okay, so if you want to try to match it the other way, right? So if you have a resistance here, low R out here at the input, and you look in from here, that will be smaller. You are basically doing a downward transformation. Okay. Okay, so what you'll find is you'll use this kind of circuit in some types of oscillators. Okay, it's called a Colpitts oscillator. Colpitts oscillator uses this kind of tap capacitor circuit. Okay, and uh, you can do a lot of analysis. So the easy way to do it, one way to do it is you can you can do a bunch of series to parallel transformations. So you can do, let's say you have a resistance here, you want to match it to the input. You can convert this parallel to a series and then combine it to the other capacitance and so on, right? So finally you want to reduce it at the frequency of interest to either a parallel or a series RLC. So it's the same uh, concept as before. So the what you'll find is your uh, in general, if you look at the uh, admittance, right? Your G in, so for this network, right? If you have G in and G out, what you'll find Okay, let me just open this again. This has some problem. It's having the same problem as before. Okay, let's see if I can continue. 
ओके सो जी एन एस जी आउट ओवर एन स्क्वायर ओके एंड वॉट इज एम एम इज कॉल दी इवन दो देर आर नो टर्न्स सो इट इज दी इट हैपन्स टू बी दी कपैसिटर रेशियो ओके इन दिस केस इट्स सी वन प्लस सी टू ओवर सी वन okay so here and that is so yeah you can you can go through the derivation in the notes okay it's pretty straight forward okay and uh, so you can you can derive the matching equations and q and so on so i won't go through that for now but the other kind there is one more kind of match which is the tap inductor match okay so you have c l1 l2 so this is another kind of match right this is just the dual of the previous one so you can you can conceive uh, a matching network of this kind also okay so let's uh, now that we have uh, you know quickly just run through this in most matching cases you may not you may not use this right in certain specific cases like oscillators the colpitt oscillator you might use uh, a tap match but in most cases you may just be satisfied with uh, uh, just the um, uh, pi match or a t match or maybe even an l match depending on the bandwidth you need okay so this is the tap tap inductor match okay okay so let's move on to today's subject which is lecture number 6 right so um, so we are going to cover rf inductors today so there's not going to be a lot of mathematics okay so not a lot of uh, in today's lecture so i'm just going to it's going to be a little bit more descriptive but you need to understand everything so make sure to listen you may you may or may not want to note down things because there are not a lot of equations or anything you can i'll i'll post the notes on the website okay so what do you know so so we found i mean i think we discussed this before so rf circuits use a lot of inductors right so they are basically analog analog circuits plus inductors right so if you have an in for example if you have a common source amplifier you could have a similar kind of amplifier except instead of a resistor or a pmos kind of load you would try to make a tuned load using e using an lc lc tank okay so you would uh, you would use inductors in a lot of places so what do you find what we find is normal digital ic process right does not have inductors because they tend to use mosfets for most things right they tend to use nmos pmos and uh, they tend to use if they want capacitors they tend to use mos capacitors so you know your input of your mosfet is is capacitive right you remember that so they tend to use capacitors and maybe in some rare cases they may use some resistors okay what do you use use nmos pmos maybe some mos capacitors right maybe some sometimes r what do analog circuits use they use the same thing same as above plus you could have some specialized capacitors you could have mom capacitors mem capacitors right so what are called uh, let's call them so mom or mem capacitors so mom stands for metal oxide metal so you are looking at the capacitance between two metal layers okay and uh, mem means metal insulator metal that is if you want higher capacitor density you could have a specialized analog process which would have so your typical oxide will have a certain you know uh, epsilon r right so you could try to use a special layer a dielectric layer which would give you a higher epsilon r which means a higher capacitance for a given area okay so you tend to use those kind of capacitors for several analog circuits because your mos capacitor has certain disadvantages we will look at that in next class okay so and what do you use what do rf circuits use so the same analog circuits plus inductors right and this is what we are going to study today so what what are the different kinds of inductors you know of so uh, have you guys studied active inductors in your uh, analog circuits course you might have uh, studied some kind of uh, have you studied like uh, uh, op amp based oscillators where you try to 
that are impedance conversion circuits. I don't know if you have studied or maybe you don't remember, but right generator circuits, right? So they try to synthesize active inductors and use those. So quite often you might see analog filters, for example, where you want to synthesize an inductor, you would try to use an active inductor, use an op amp plus some capacitors or resistors to generate an inductor. Okay. Problem with that? What do you have? You have noise. It's a big problem. Okay. You have problems. You have extra power cons consumption, so you don't want that. And third thing, also another very important thing, distortion, right? So anytime you add a transistor, op amp, things like that, you have to worry about distortion, linearity effects. Okay. So these are obvious three big problems with active inductors. So what you'll find is most RF circuits will use passive inductors. Okay. So there are two kinds of passive inductors. Okay. So you have um, what are called spiral inductors and you can have, so the spiral inductors can be created on the chip. We'll just look at it momentarily or you can have, um, we discussed this before, you have a bond wire, you have what is called a bond wire connecting your on chip circuits to your off chip PCB, right? To off chip uh, the, the leads coming out from the IC. So you could try to use those in the inductance of that line to simulate, uh, to, you can use that inductance in your circuit. Okay. Okay, so you pretty much use this one of, I mean, you pretty much use one of these in every, almost every kind of RF circuit you can think of. Amplifiers, if you have uh, certain kinds of mixers, that is transmission mixers, you have uh, power amplifiers, uh, you have VCOs, so all kinds of circuits, right? We'll be using one of these two. Okay, now let's take a step back, right? So let's look at something called skin effect. Have you heard of this? No. Okay. So some of you have heard of it, right? So what is it? So if you look at, so, okay. So let's say, so you take a current carrying line, right? You try to pass current through it. So if you pass DC current, well and good, right? So let's say you pass DC. What you'll find is the current is well distributed all around the, all through the inductor. Okay. Now, when you have AC, right? Do you remember Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction? So what happens? So when you have a, a current carrying wire, right? And which has AC current, a time varying magnetic field, right? It tends to produce uh, electric field, it tends to produce a current which produces um, uh, again an electric or magnetic field which opposes the original direction of current, right? So what happens? So if you take a cross section, right? So let's take the, so in the case of DC, this is DC, right? So if you take the case of AC and it so turns out that that magnetic field is inversely proportional to 1 over R squared, right? So what you'll find is even inside the inductor, those magnetic fields will change the current flow patterns, okay? So you'll find that most of the current tends to flow away from the center. So it tends to flow in the thinner and thinner concentric rings closer to the surface because your magnetic field happens to be largest closer to the origin, right? So the current gets pushed out and this also happens to be de uh, dependent on frequency, right? So the higher the frequency, the thinner the sheet over which the current travels, okay? So, if you have a resistance, right, if your DC resistance, what is it? Rho L over A, right? Resistivity times the length of the inductor over the area of cross section. In this case, what happens? So, you have an RAC, okay, which is much smaller because your cross sectional area of uh, current travel is much lower, right? So, what you can do is, you can show that this is Okay, where R is the radius, okay, and your delta, right, is called your skin depth. 
okay and your skin depth is also related to your frequency and other parameters in this way okay and where of course sigma is 1 over uh, resistivity right sigma is conductivity omega is the frequency and mu is the permeability okay okay so if you look at some uh, you know you can look at the resistivity and permeability of different materials what you will find is so let us look at some materials right you have aluminum copper let us look at gold so you can calculate right based on your resistivity so it turns out for example 1.82 micrometers so this I am calculating at some certain at 2 gigahertz okay so if you see this has 1.48 this has 1.76 Okay, so these are just some random numbers. What that means is, even if you have, let's say, a 10 micron, you know, diameter line, your current, actual current is only, most of your current is only going to flow through your a uh, 2 micron thick region. Okay. Okay. Now, if you look at bond wires, right? Let's look at the different kinds. We'll consider bond wires first because you tend to use them much less. I mean, uh, very uncommon. It's very uncommon to use bond wires. Okay. So typical bond wires, right? They are actually quite thick. So diameter can be as high as 25 micrometers. Okay, so they are nice and thick. So you can get a very high Q, right? So you can get, uh, you know, 20 to 30 easily. Okay. in the 1 to 10 gigahertz range, right? Which is in most cases you'd be interested in this range. You can get very high Qs. Now the other thing is they're made with gold, right? In most cases, so they have actually pretty good resistivity. Now the problem is, I need to find out what I'm doing wrong with this. Okay, the problem is, okay, so you take any process, you want to hit a particular L value, but due to you know the way you bond it, right? You will have a large variation in the inductance value. This can actually be quite high, right? This can be uh, you know 25 percent or so, which is quite quite large, right? If you want to hit uh, 2 nano Henry, you could be between 1.5 and 2.5. That's a lot. Okay? So you would tend to use this less, or if you use it, you need to have some plan to cover this variation in inductance value. And what you will find is, for this diameter, the inductance is, you can get this approximately, okay, so this is a very approximate number, but if you have 1 millimeter long bond wire, you would get around 1 nano Henry. Okay, so this is what we are going to spend the majority of the time on this, in this class. So what we tend to do in, in spiral inductors, you try to, uh, let us say you have a certain metal layer on your process, you try to create a spiral using that, using that metal, okay. So you could have something like this, something like this, okay. So and of course, okay, so let us uh, do a better job of this. Okay, so inductance is between these two points. So it's a bunch of transmission lines, right? Connected up in series and very compact because if you just have a single transmission line, it goes a long way. Your two points will be very far away. So you try to bend it around, fold it around. Okay, now what you would uh, try to do is, so now, first of all, this is very area intensive. Okay, so you would find that quite often you would have several hundred microns. So it is very huge. Okay, so this is called the diameter, external diameter, right? 
So the different you know characteristics of this uh, spiral inductor would be you have an external diameter, you have an inner diameter which is dn, okay. You have a trace width w, okay, and you have the spacing s between the turns. Each one of these will affect your inductor parameters. We will look at what the inductor parameters are. So these are your degrees of freedom, right? So you have d in, d out, s, w and once you choose all of these, I mean once you obviously once you choose w, d in and d out, right? You can get a, and, and your s, you get a certain number of turns of the inductor. So that is, I mean that is an, that is a second level, uh, you know, uh, parameter, okay? Okay. So what do you know? Intuitively you know your inductance is going to be proportional to your area of your inductor. The larger the area, right, the more the inductance you have because the larger the length of trace you can apply. And of course for a given area, if you make your trace width smaller, you can have more number of turns which means you can get more inductance. Okay, so the number of turns is also pretty important. Okay, okay. Now the other thing you'll find is, do you remember what M is? M stands for mutual inductance, right? So what happens? Let's say you have current flowing through this inductor. Okay. So let's say you have current flowing here, in here. So it goes through this and in this trace it flows the same direction. What happens when you have two conductors having you know the same current in parallel right? You have a the magnetic fields tend to add up. So that produces a mutual inductance right and that tends to add to your effective inductance. Okay. So that is your total inductance you have to take into account self inductance and mutual inductance. Okay. So, in, okay, so you have this has two components. So, let us go back to the figure. Okay, so we looked at current flowing this way, right? So, take this guy. How does this current flow? In this side, the current flows in the opposite direction, right? So between these two adjacent lines, your mutual inductance is additive. But between this line and these three lines, it is destructive, right? So that tends to reduce your inductance. Okay, just keep that in mind. So all these are parameters which you will take into account when designing your inductor. So you need to make sure. So what you would tend to do is the distance between you know the conductors on this side and this side is determined by your d in inner diameter. So you tend to create very hollow inductors. So you would have a very large inner diameter so that your negative mutual effects are reduced as much as possible. Okay. And the other thing you will you, you might tend to do is reduce your S. Why? The closer you make the adjacent inductors, the more the mutual effects you will get. Right? And remember your resistance, typically your resistive effects are decided by your DC resistance and your skin effect. Most of the series resistance. So your it is a significant portion of your Q. So if you can wind it more tightly and get more inductance for a given length of wire, that is actually better for your Q, for your losses in the inductor. <coughs> okay. Yes, it usually is. But then, so yeah, you are right, M because it is closer, because it depends, uh, magnetic field depends on distance, right? So the closer it is, the more more mutual effects it will have. So that is why you try to make your S very small, so you have adjacent uh, conductors are closer and you make your inner diameter large so that the other ones are far away. You would have both effects. So you want to increase one effect, decrease the other effect. Okay. What are some of the other high frequency effects? <coughs> 
so let's take the side view of an of a couple of lines right okay so let's uh, i'm going to draw two transmission lines here okay so let's say this is one and this is the other actually draw them a little bit closer okay so you have two lines so let's say you have some certain currents flowing through this right so let's in this case let's take the case let's assume that the currents are flowing the same direction it could be the opposite direction so this those effects will vary what kind of effects do you have okay so first of all you have we just discussed this right proximity effects so the depending on the distance between them and then what you'll find because you have a magnetic field associated with these you'd find that these lines are actually radiating energy into the substrate into the into the air so you have radiation losses okay or radiative effects okay then what you have your inductors are on metal lines which have some capacitance to the substrate okay so you would have some substrate coupling effects okay then what do you have so since earlier we considered a cylindrical inductor cylindrical conductor okay now these are going to be almost like a she almost like sheets of metal so what happens when you have edges right these are discontinuities in the current flow so what happens you tend to have crowding of charge carriers in the edges okay so you have what are called edge effects okay then you could have a nearby substrate contacts so you would add substrate contacts to make sure maybe your transistor sub bulk needs to be connected to the substrate or something like that so those would affect your inductance value okay and your q because that will cause lateral what you are effectively doing is you are by giving substrate contacts you are giving some low impedance paths to the substrate okay so that could cause substrate effects okay the last thing let's use a different color so you have an you have a spiral inductor right so current is flowing in a certain direction what happens if you so your substrate is either depending on which process you have it's either mildly conductive or very conductive so you will have okay so you'll have you remember eddy currents right okay so you have this is again related to faraday's law right you have a conductor close to a magnetic uh, you know in, in a magnetic field time varying magnetic field that will have some currents which would produce your inverse uh, uh, inverse magnetic field but the main idea is since current is flowing your substrate has a certain resistivity resistance and that means you have losses as heat right so all those would figure into the losses of your inductor okay so let's now look at the now the other kind of edge effect is just remember this for the future if you have an uh, if you're trying to send an rf signal through a uh, through a line through a metal line you want to avoid these kind of 90 degree edges because you could have crowding effects here okay when the conductors want to turn direction you would have crowding at the edges okay so these points will become high density 
uh, high density uh, high current density points okay you could have some bad effects in the process as well you could, your metal could wear away for example over time okay so normally what you would do is instead of going this way you would tend to use something like this if you want to have an rf transmission line it could be a, it, it doesn't even in an inductor you would definitely prefer this but if you are trying to connect let's say an amplifier to a mixer right and you need to route the uh, connection from the output to the input, you would try to use 45 degree lines, okay, as much as possible. Okay, and of course we'll look at substrate losses, so I'll uh, um, we'll we'll get to that. So some common geometries are, so we looked at the square spiral. So this is called a So this is called a square spiral, right? Because it's obviously because it's square in shape. So if your process allows, you can have some other kinds of spirals. For example, you could have. Let me draw this a little bit. Uh, okay, it is medium. Okay. So you could have a circular spiral, right? or you could have an octagon sorry and so on right so you use 45 degree lines to create an octagon sorry i'm not very good at drawing obviously but let us assume this is an octagon, right? Okay. And what you will find is because there are no edge effects for a given area, you most efficiently use, um, uh, use metal area to create an inductor in the circular spiral case. Usually that will give you your best cube because there are no edges and it is very smooth, right? And octagon is still better than your square spiral. You will typically get uh, maybe 10 or 15 percent higher Q. Okay, but the octagon that is 45 degree lines are supported by most processes nowadays. Circular spirals, on the other hand, it's quite rare. Okay. Okay. So what is did? So the other thing you should notice is, in all the cases we have been looking at. So what did we do? So we, we made this the inductor, right? However, just remember if you need to connect it to a circuit, you need access to both the terminals. So obviously the inner terminal needs to be brought out. Okay. So you would what you would do is you would put in some contacts, go down to a different metal layer and then go up. The reason is the, the inductor would typically be made on the topmost metal. Okay. The reason is topmost metals are usually much thicker than the bottom metals okay that is one reason second reason your substrate losses are proportion uh, are inversely proportional to the distance of your inductor from your substrate so the farther away it is the lower the substrate losses okay so let's look at this let's try to i'll try to do a better job of drawing the inductor this time Oh man. Let me try to Okay, so now you need to create what's called an underpass. Okay? And then you would usually come back to the same metal. Okay, you would have two ports. So, what does this look like in the cross section? Okay, so you have this. So, you would have this metal 
so you just look at the side uh, side view of the whole thing right so this is w this is s right this is your d in and d out and so on right that's what it's going to look like but more importantly what you have here is you have the underpass right so let's assume these two form the underpass so you So this is, these are your vs, okay, and then let's create this in the. So what you are doing is your current is coming in, going down, coming up, and then going back to your original metal. That's this section. What is the rest? This is one oxide, right? And then you have a second oxide here. oxide 1 oxide 2 so oxide 2 is one is obviously between this metal layer and this metal layer oxide 2 is between this metal layer and substrate let's say let's say we don't have any more uh, okay the other thing you should notice is this inductor is now asymmetric right obviously one side has an underpass the other side does not so if you want a symmetric inductor it is going to be a problem your uh, parasitics are different so your capacitive parasitics are different because this section has larger it's closer to the substrate has a higher capacitance this is on a lower metal layer usually that's more resistive so you have a larger series resistance okay and what you will find is in many cases this underpass resistance could limit your inductor q okay so you have to be a little bit careful how you might want to you might want to use two metal layers for example if you are not worried about the capacitance you can go closer to the substrate and then strap two metal layers together and then create your so you could do something like this for example you could have a second metal layer and uh, let's see let's use this so you could have something like this strap two metal layers and use that to make it look thicker right it won't be exactly the same as being thicker you could do that okay so now let's look at modeling how do we model this inductor okay so what do we need for a physical model so what all do you think we need for a physical model anyone inductance okay so obviously you need the inductance ls let's call it ls series inductance okay what is do you need RS. series resistance okay so let's call it rs okay parasitic capacitance okay so what you'll find is there are two kinds of parasitic capacitances so you have the oxide parasitic capacitance okay and then you have the what is called cc because remember these two conductors will have a capacitance between them right you have two current carrying lines they have a capacitance similarly you're going to have capacitance between this and this underpass so that adds actually a cc which is called the series coupling capacitance okay then you'll also have so the inductance is between is uh, the model is okay so your cox for example is to the substrate right your substrate depending on your doping levels it's going to have a resistance it's going to have a capacitance okay so you have csi and rsi okay so it's going to look like this so you have your rs l um that is your coupling cap okay then you want to try to make your model symmetric okay so you try to add c ox on both sides try to split the c ox overall oxide capacitance is c ox over 2 and then so you represent this as a these are your two ports so you have rsi and csi are you able to see that 
you able to see that right this is become too small rsi and csi okay this would be a standard model sometimes what you would do is your cox csi and rsi could be replaced as simply as if you want your model to be simpler you could replace this just simply as some kind of r equivalent and c equivalent quite often you will see models like that where you don't have two capacitors but just a single capacitor okay obviously the, this kind of circuit is not purely physical but it may be good enough for your needs and just remember this model in in reality remember your resistance is proportional to the frequency or sorry your resistance depends on frequency right it gets larger in some way it's it's if you remember your skin effect right it's resistance is inversely proportional to like uh, one over root of uh, delta and delta is proportional to one over root of omega and so on right so your resistance is going to be a function of frequency inductance will end up being a function of frequency so a lot of these parameters but what you can try to do is let's say you are trying to do an electromagnetic simulation of your inductor you would you would obtain your s parameters at these two ports then you try to model those s parameters into a lumped equivalent circuit in reality this inductor is actually distributed right each one of these is a transmission line so the electromagnetic simulator does that for you and over your band of interest you would try to model the inductor into something like this okay so this will be valid over a certain frequency range that is something you have to remember sir uh, rsi it could yes it could definitely CSI is basically your your substrate has a certain capability to hold charge store charge right so it's it is just your capacity of your substrate to hold charge that's all it is at, at the end of the day the reason this is happening is your inductance is to the substrate right the actual substrate contact is somewhere far away so you're going to have some resistance to that point and the substrate itself can hold some hold some charge so that is that uh, is modeled by CSI okay so we looked at the dependence of ls right so what does rs depend on sorry obviously it depends on the resistivity of the metal and the width of your trace right obviously it's proportional to resistivity and it's inversely proportional to 1 over w or the area of cross section okay and the other thing you should remember obviously it's proportional to the overall length of your inductor okay and the other things obviously you should consider are you no know, skin effect proximity effects and so on okay what does cc depend on is your input output coupling capacitance right so this is your metal layer to your underpass dominates your overall capacitance but you could have some interturn capacitance also between two metal adjacent metal lines okay yes it's a distributed model but you are trying to create a lump model so this would be uh, full so for if you have a certain inductance so you want an inductance of let's say 3 nano henrys this would this would be in ohms they won't be in per unit values okay there would be in ohms capacitance and you know resistance and so on so you are trying to model it so in reality you you know okay so what happens is there is okay so in reality if you look at a distributed model of this right you have some capacitance between these two adjacent lines so if you start splitting it into transmission lines so you would have one lump one rlgc model another rlgc model you would have some capacitance between them right and then capacitance between the next one and so on what you are trying to do is create a lump equivalent you know there is some effective input to output coupling capacitance there is some capacitive effect going on okay so this is actually a lump element equivalent model that is uh, it is somewhat physical in the sense you are trying to model something physical but you are trying to do it at a particular frequency that is all okay and cc obviously again proportional to the area the larger the inductor right wider the inductor you could have larger capacitance then oxide thickness of course 
yeah of course so those are all i mean yeah that is uh, taken right oxide typically oxide permittivity does not change much uh, you know it's the same oxide right so the epsilon r is some 3.9 for your oxide or 4 so that doesn't change depending on your uh, whether it's between metal to metal or metal to substrate or so on same oxide is put yeah it's the same oxide which is put okay and again your sea ox right and same thing oxide thickness except in this case it is metal to metal oxide thickness in this case it is metal to substrate and of course you have RSI CSI which depend on your substrate like doping and so on right okay doping and uh, other things okay so <coughs> what are your figures of merit actually looks like we are running out of time so the next few minutes if you don't mind i'll take a few more minutes we'll quickly run through the uh, this thing so because i want to move on to other things this is not uh, is only descriptive but i want to look, uh, look at the figures of merit of the inductor quickly so obviously the first one is Q, right? So how do you define Q? You can use the physical definition 2 pi times you know energy, peak energy stored over energy dissipated per cycle. So that is one way to do it. But we know that you know that is somewhat related to your you know we looked at uh, if, if you take a one port right, if you take an, uh, any load, you can look at it as imaginary part of Z over imaginary part of Z over real part of Z, right? So you can if your inductance is between two ports okay or it is also equal to imaginary part of y over real part of y okay you can use if you want to look at admittances you will get the same uh, same uh, this things okay same expressions and what you can do is you can define what is called a actually what you want to really do is an inductive queue right because your your you know that your inductor has r l c and many of them right it's not going to be simple to analyze it as your earlier uh, cases so what you're going to do is you're going to use imaginary part over real part but what you'll find is at some frequency your capacitive uh, uh, impedances right will become dominant over your inductive impedances so in in other words it's no longer an inductor it's a capacitor okay beyond that this kind of you have to be careful because if you just use this right you could have some problem because you might find q going negative because your imaginary part becomes negative so it's th this kind of so if you for, for example if you take a parallel rlc right you can define it as omega l minus oh sorry let's use the because it's parallel we'll use admittance this is your imaginary part over admittance right you can use something like this so your effective inductance keeps decreasing as frequency goes and so that will you know that will behave uh, that will change your q behavior and what you'll find is your q looks some will will look something like this okay so at capacitance will will not be dominant at very low frequencies okay and what happens so it's inductive so it kind of increases and then eventually it will max out because your capacitance becomes more dominant okay i mean this is not necessarily just for a parallel rlc i'm talking about a real inductor okay which has a lot of capacitors and, uh, and inductors and then what you'll find it will steeply drop and of course because you're using this kind of expression it will look as if it's going negative because your capacitance you know impedance changes as a function of frequency right so you, you could get something like this so where do you want to ideally operate you want to ideally operate at this point right you get your maximum q so you define your uh, you know width length diameter everything such that this point falls close to your operating frequency okay the other thing is many some people some people prefer to operate just a little bit off somewhere here 
they want to make sure for example your capacitive parasitics could change you don't want to be pushed over to this side because q falls very steeply okay so some people might be tempted to operate here where your q does not change much and that's uh, that's a good idea q as a function of frequency okay and there are other things you can do to improve your q for example your substrate losses are caused by ad currents right so below your inductor let's say your inductor is on the fifth metal layer the topmost one and you have metal 1 to metal 5 what you can do is on the on metal 1 you can create what is called a pattern ground shield okay what you would do is right below the inductor so assume that the inductor is on metal 5 so you would create something like this okay So these are actually slots, it's not connected here and these are metal strips. So what happens? The shield effectively shields your inductor from the substrate because you have a conductor, right? All your obviously magnetic field lines will you know terminate through this conductor instead of going to the substrate, okay? So, but then what happens? Normally the eddy current tries to flow through this, right? It tries to flow like this in some certain direction. But now the slots will prevent the currents from flowing circularly. Sorry? This is an this is the eddy current path. And uh, this is called the uh, a pattern ground chain. Okay. So here it will stop your eddy currents from flowing which means what happens your losses of an inductor are, uh, are reduced that means your effective resist uh, effective let's say your uh, RSI right would decrease or actually would increase because it happens to be in shunt okay but you also have to remember that C ox also increases okay what that means is if you go back to your is that clear because now you are effective bringing your effective you know ground plane closer to your inductor right so the what that means is this is called your self resonant frequency when your inductor effectively is no longer has any inductance so that will move with a pattern ground shield that will move lower which means obviously this will also move lower right okay so you might there may be cases when you want to use it there may be cases when you don't want to use it if you if you're interested in absolute highest q you would want to use it if you're worried more about broadband you know operation you may be worried about using the pattern ground shield okay so let's see what else is there of course the other figure of merit is the total area occupied right that's that is that is a pretty obvious figure of merit okay that's an obvious thing so let's stop here next class we'll uh, we'll look at uh, transformers okay and then we'll look at capacitors and varactors right so transformers we'll see so there may be cases where you want to do differential to single unit conversion or you may have a differential circuit where you might want to use a transformer instead of two inductors. So we'll uh, look at those cases next week. Okay. Okay. So we'll continue on. Uh, uh, okay. So next week Monday happens to be a holiday. So we'll be meeting on Tuesday morning at eight o'clock. Okay. So.